let me just stipulate what a reasonable policy uh, in the European context might look like. I can do that, I think, because uh, I was able to participate in drafting one. It's called The Modest Proposal, um, co-authored by myself, uh, by uh, Stuart Holland, um, former Labour Member of Parliament, now a professor in Portugal at Coimbra, and Yanis Varoufakis, uh, whose name you may have heard recently. Uh, <clears throat> that proposal sought to operate entirely within the framework of existing European treaties and charters, and that's the, in respect of which it is actually a modest proposal, it's an effort, in other words, to set out a realistic, not an overly ambitious, but a realistic framework for a change of European policy in a uh, more progressive and more successful direction. And it had four elements. The first was an initiative to deal with what are plainly unpayable and unsustainable debts, a problem that will have to be dealt with at some point. And our idea was to mutualize those debts through the institutional framework of the European Central Bank to make the Maastricht compliant portion for participating states the first 60% essentially financeable at the rates and on the terms that are available through to the European Central Bank. This would make it much easier, of course, to finance the rest. The second was an investment initiative, the framework for what might be called a New Deal for Europe that would use the existing institutions, the European Investment Bank, European Investment Fund, um, to uh, begin a much needed program of new construction, reconstruction, environmental investment, social investment, and employment for all of Europe, but especially for those regions which have been so strongly affected in the last five years by the European crisis. Uh, it occurred to us more recently that these two initiatives could be to some degree combined since the European Central Bank was launching a program of quantitative easing uh, that the bonds of the European Investment Bank could become the vehicle for such a program, that the ECB could buy those bonds, and that that would enable the EIB to ramp up its operations to a much larger scale uh, than it has uh, presently or in the past without infringing on its creditworthiness. So again, practical, reasonable proposals to change the direction of the broader uh, line of policy in Europe. The third element was a case-by-case -case resolution at the European level of um, insolvent or failing banks, with the idea being that part of the problem in the European setting has been the, I think, undeniably toxic relationship between large banks and governments, uh, and that dealing with this problem should be something that is done at the European level, but that should not require uh, all of the uh, uh, immobility, immobilism that's associated with the current proposals for a banking union. And the fourth element is a solidarity program, a program which would have extended to the vulnerable populations, to the troubled populations, to the unemployed populations, to the hungry populations in parts of Europe, uh, a helping hand that could be financed at the European scale using the uh, resources of the Target 2 mechanism. Uh, and the idea there uh, is drawing on the historic experience of the United States uh, and other large federations uh, that uh, part of the purchasing power of the society has to be provided on a common basis through a common social insurance fund, and that this is not only necessary or useful for humanitarian purposes, but an extremely important way to stabilize all of the regions, in the European case, all of the countries, uh, against the worst consequences of a harsh economic environment. So that was our program, it was circulating for a number of years, and uh, you will notice that it is on nobody's agenda, that it is simply not part of the framework of current discussion.
Yeah, well, there we are. Uh, so what is on the agenda is something much narrower, far more modest still, uh, and that is uh, the uh, issues that are under discussion between the recently elected government of Greece and its European partners. Uh, the government of Greece is in a distinctive position of having uh, basically put onto the agenda a, a set of variances or changes from the standard uh, menu of uh, policies, austerity policies, economic so-called liberalization policies, and so forth, that have been the uh, universal fare of European policymaking, at least since the start of the crisis, and whose ideological origins go back a good deal longer than that. The government of Greece has accepted a fairly large part of the agenda uh, of the uh, institutions and of the prior regimes with respect to uh, public administration and changes in the structure of taxation. Some of those are non-controversial. Some of them are, are with reservations. But there are a number of elements uh, which the government of Greece uh, has not accepted. And because of its both reasoned uh, positions and political commitments is not going to accept. So there are four of those, and I think I should just take a moment and go over them, because uh, even though I'm sure that you are familiar with them in broad terms. The first is that the government should be committed to macroeconomic targets with respect to a primary surplus that are reasonable and achievable, and that will not keep the economy, or at least have a chance, of releasing the Greek economy from a state of permanent depression, an ongoing decline. It is not prepared to sign on to macroeconomic targets uh, that it cannot achieve, and which, if it attempted to achieve, would produce a further destruction of the Greek economy and of the Greek social economy, which has already lost, as I'm sure you know, about 30% of its output, of its annual output, over the last five years. So that is a first so-called red line, uh, and one which is, uh, I think, incontestably reasonable, given the experience of five years of decline when recovery was always being predicted and always just around the corner. The second broad line of variance it has to do with pensions, and the Greek government is not prepared to accept a um, reduction in pensions to people who are already quite poor. 44% of pension owners, uh, pension receivers in Greece are already below uh, the poverty line, uh, receive very modest benefits. Uh, and the Greek government's position is that the unsustainability of finances in the pension system, which is the argument for further reductions, is the result of the poor economic performance and therefore of the shortfall in tax revenues and uh, pension contributions, and that curing the poor economic performance is the right approach to the pension system uh, and the only civilized approach given the stresses that have or already been felt uh, by pensioners in Greece. And the third proposition has to do with labor standards and with collective bargaining, in which it's fair to say, I think, that uh, Greeks have been subjected to what amounts to an unethical experiment, an experiment for which you could not get approval if you were an academic researcher uh, going before your institutional review board. I look over at my academic colleague, Professor Spriggs, and, uh, and uh, he can explain it to you later. Uh, the, uh, but basically, when you're working with human subjects, you need to be doing things which are not risking grave harm. And what the Greeks have been asked to do and what they have done in their labor markets has inflicted great harm on the working population of Greece without producing improvement in exports, gains in jobs that were in some abstract but completely unrealistic theory supposed to result. Instead, what has concretely happened on the ground in Greece is a vast increase in the informalization of the labor market so that people who were previously working 
or who might otherwise be working uh, in the formal sector uh, are being paid, if they're working at all, off the books in cash, not contributing to the pension system, and therefore uh, aggravating the fiscal problems of the state. What the Greek government has requested instead is that the international standards that apply elsewhere in Europe, and indeed normally elsewhere in the world, the standards of the ILO, be applied in Greece. That's the third red line of the government. And the fourth one has to do with privatizations, where the position of the uh, government, I think, would not meet argument from any moderately well-trained economist, or for that matter, any business person. Uh, and it is simply that if you put everything on the auction block at once, you're very unlikely to get an acceptable price. That's what's called a fire sale. And the evidence uh, that that is a correct position is very strong because, in fact, many things have gone on the auction block and the revenue resulting has been very small in relation to what was expected or predicted. So the argument in, let's say, uh, broad logical terms and on the basis of evidence, that is to say the argument on the merits for these positions is essentially incontestable. But although these issues are on the table and the novelty is that there is an actual discussion or at least the framework of a negotiation, there is no sign of acquiescence in reasoned argument. Instead, what you read in the papers following every session and every meeting of the Eurogroup of the finance ministers is that the Greeks are being told to stop stalling, to get on with it, to move faster, as though the presentation of their negotiating position uh, cannot possibly be serious, cannot possibly be something that is actually uh, to be discussed or responded to, but must be merely the necessary political theater for the home audience before the government becomes realistic and agrees to the terms as specified uh, for the other side. Now, why is this? I think the answer to that is that it's very clearly not a question of economic policy argument, but a question of power. Uh, and that in the context uh, that we see in Europe, uh, the power has passed into the hands of institutions and into the hands of economists uh, who are a, uh, let's say, mutually reinforcing tribe who uh, set the policy of those institutions, who have been brought up in a certain tradition over the past generation, which is the mainstream tradition in economics, uh, and who are not judged uh, even crudely by the results of their policies. These are not like generals who lose battles or naval officers who run their ships aground or uh, political leaders who face elections. These are people who are judged by their peers in a rather strict hierarchy of perceived intelligence and merit. Uh, and uh, the judgment is therefore based on their conformity to the previously established ideas. I know nothing else. And in that situation, when things do not go according to plan, there are always three reasons that can be invoked. One is that, well, initial conditions were worse than expected, so nobody could have foreseen how badly things were going to turn out. The second one is that the policies, while not wrong, were not applied with sufficient zeal, and therefore what is needed is more of the same. And the third is, well, wait a minute, it's going to be all right. The forecast says recovery is going to start in three or six months' time. Right? And some combination of those three, it's very hard to make an argument against three positions at once. Uh, that's probably why Caesar divided Gaul into three parts. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, <coughs> some part of those propositions always holds up in the public uh, sphere, or at least gets past the, the even the modestly critical ear of the mainstream press. Uh, and therefore, anyone who challenges them and challenges the rationalizations behind them, as the Greek government has been doing, and has been doing with a great deal of eloquence and coherence, 
don't know if you saw uh, the article uh, of, of Prime Minister Cyprus in the Huffington Post two days, or yesterday, I guess, in, at least in the, in the French edition. And it's a nice example of the clarity of their position. Uh, but anybody who takes these positions is to be dismissed on grounds of character uh, or other uh, personal defects. I mean, it's an old story. We could tell the same story, those of us who have been in American politics, uh, could tell the same story about American institutions and about the way in which, uh, let's say, the Congressional Budget Office influences and distorts the policymaking process in the United States. But this is the situation that we face, it seems to me, if we want to have, uh, if we want to uh, press for a more progressive set of policies, we need first to frame what they are and then to focus on the political uh, battles that are required to create uh, the powerful enough institutional frameworks for making those changes occur. In the European context, it seems to me, uh, this is the uh, judgment that has already been reached by the Greek government, which is that there must be a political solution. Whether there will be a political solution in time to prevent dramatic events in the next six weeks is a very interesting question to which no one that I know has a definitive answer. But it will either happen in the next six weeks with respect to the uh, position of the Greek government, or it will happen some months later when some other country decides or is pressed by its electorate to move into a similar position of refusal to cooperate with what are plainly failed policies. That country might be Spain, might be Portugal, might be Ireland, might be Italy, might be France. But it will happen if it doesn't happen in Greece, it will happen somewhere else, so the problem uh, is not going to go away. And if it is not dealt with within the framework of the existing European institutions, which is what the Greek government hopes for, and what Yanis and Stewart and I uh, basically uh, <coughs> constrained ourselves to argue for in writing the modest proposal, then it will happen as the result of significant changes in the structure of European economic governing institutions. Uh, and those significant changes will be disruptive, uh, but they will be basically impossible to avoid at some point because after all, debts that cannot be paid will not be paid, conditions that cannot be agreed to will not be agreed to, things that must change will eventually change.